I think I start this off with a video, because sometimes you've already fallen asleep, but you're already excited. Thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate you. Yeah, what great music. But let's just watch this little clip, if it's in there. Turn the lights down. Oh, thank you. Get the whole movie effect. It has one bad word in this clip, so... In the fall of 1991, the Andrea Gale left Gloucester, Massachusetts and headed for the fishing grounds of the North Atlantic. Two weeks later, an event took place that had never occurred in recorded history. So that's my title this morning, The Perfect Storm. I picked up uh, Sebastian, uh, probably a German would say Junger, this is with a J, yeah, Americans might say Junger. Um, I picked up his book, The Perfect Storm, uh, in the airport because I was getting ready to get on a plane from San Antonio to Atlanta to Tokyo. And you know, sometimes you can't eat seven more meals or watch six more movies, so you buy something to read. And I really enjoyed it, and Brenda and I had lived uh, for a period of time um, about four miles from Gloucester. We were in Rockport, Massachusetts, and Gloucester, Mass, is uh, where this boat, where these fishing boats took off. And we'd seen that very monument you, you see of the sailor with the, uh, the helm there ready to go. We've been there, and, and that's where we used to, where'd Brenda go? That's where we ordered pizza from, remember? <laughs> that was the pizza place they delivered to the house. So uh, it was, you know, really connected for me, and then the movie came out a little bit later. If you know anything about that, and the book was based on fact, and, and of course the movie's got a little bit of romance in it probably that may or may not have been in the book, but nonetheless, um, six men lost their life on the uh, Andrea Gale, and uh, a helicopter, rescue helicopter went down, and one uh, pararescueman uh, lost his life in that as well. So seven people died, and the author, actually it was a meteorologist that uh, coined this phrase, the perfect storm, because it was the, the convergence of weather going one way and another way, and you know, the ocean, how it responded, and it made a perfect storm that these men were out in. And, and obviously, they were pursuing their income. They were, they were trying to make money and thought that they could survive it, and they did not. But as I would define the word perfect and perfect storm, I would not find much perfection in losing seven lives. And I know there were seven families that were forever changed because of that storm those many years ago. But today, we pick up with a storm that happens on the Sea of Galilee following the feeding of the 5,000. Those of you who've been here for months now know that we're working our way through the Gospel of John. And last week, Jesus fed basically an entire city. Uh, at least the cities that I grew up in. In fact, that's bigger than my city. Uh, but it's 5,000 men. Most accounts say 5,000 men and then women and children on top of that. So you can imagine how large the crowd was. And then he tells his disciples, uh, in other gospel accounts we'll see it. We don't see it in John. I'll talk to you a little bit more about the differences between the three accounts that we have in the synoptic gospels. Um, he tells these 12 men to get out and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And that convergence of a storm and the Son of God for us today, in that I see the perfect storm. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the sixth chapter. We pick up right at the end, and that's the way it works out in Matthew and in Mark, that right after the feeding of the 5,000, this event happens. So here we begin, chapter 6, verse 16 in the Gospel of John. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now, it was dark. Some suggest that they waited and waited and waited for Jesus to come, and finally they said, hey, let's go. He's not coming, so they went on in the dark. And Jesus had not joined them. 
Verse 18, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, some of your translations, yeah, King James may say stadia, that's a, where we get the word stadium from, that's about an eighth of a mile in U.S. measurements. Um, so three to three and a half miles, Jesus approaches the boat walking on the water. Walking on the water. And they were terrified, as you and I would be, I'm sure, if you saw someone walking on the water. But he says to them, it is I. Some of you who are language aficionados, it is truly I am. Maybe a little bit of telegraphing of the I am statements that John will make or connection with the Father who says to Moses, who shall I say sent me? Some the I am sent me. But let's not get hung up on that. The big part is, he says, it is I, do not or don't be afraid. Then they were willing, I thought, then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, and I, and I will not spend a lot of time with these verses, but I want you to see what's happening. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that the only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into those boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. In other words, here's a guy who's just fed us for free. Where'd he go? Didn't have any way to get across the water. So these boats showed up and they went after him. And then the, the next Sunday's message will deal with what he addresses the crowd about their search for this bread. But let, let me ask you to pray with me now as we look at what is a familiar story to most of us, Jesus walking on the water, and how that applies to our walk with him today. Father, as we look at this uh, familiar text, and uh, we see John being the most uh, brief of the writers who tell this story for us. So let us focus in on the common things that we can see and the lessons we can have for our life about how Jesus... Um, is with us in the storms of our life and how we can seek uh, salvation through him. So I pray if there's one today who is struggling with uh, the troubles and the rough seas of their life, that you would show them that Christ not only will throw out a lifeline, he will jump in the boat with them and he will get them to their destination. So speak to our hearts today. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So. I have a slide because I think it's important, and I haven't done this on all, you know, up to this point in the Gospel of John, but I think it's important because you read, like I asked, and Dan, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know where you are again. Are you up in the booth? Yeah. Is he, he's asleep somewhere. Okay. Um, as I would be if I wasn't preaching. But um, I asked him this week, I said, why did the disciples go to the other side? And Dan, as, as I would have said, had I not just read this again to tell him, he said, well, Jesus told him to, uh, not in the Gospel of John. John does not say, Jesus said, go to the other side. He just says they went to the other side. So uh, you have a slide up there, I hope, maybe another one, that will show these comparisons. Matthew 14, uh, and let me back up. I, I don't want to try to ever uh, talk down to you, but if you've never heard somebody say this, it's important to know that most biblical commentators think that Mark, the Gospel of Mark, was written first, and that perhaps other Gospel writers use Mark as a source for their writings. So if Mark says it, more than likely Matthew or Luke might say it. Interestingly enough, Luke doesn't say it at all. And this week I think I misspoke as I was talking to another friend. I said, well, these both were disciples of Jesus who would have a firsthand account. The writer of Mark, most commentators, is, is, they will say, is John Mark, a young man that is mentioned in the Gospel of, of uh, Mark, by himself. There's a reference in, in the night when Jesus was betrayed about a young man standing off to the side. And some think that that is Mark making inference to himself. Nonetheless, Matthew is the disciple. Luke was the doctor that wrote both Luke and Acts. So you have these two versions that are not in competition. I think they complement, but they, I want you to see that in both of those, Jesus tells them to go. Both of those Jesus has gone away. In fact, some say he dismissed the crowd. Then he goes up higher on the mountain to pray. 
I love how some commentators, and, and I mean, we all are guilty. You know, I'm looking at Pierce. We'll all pull things out. He was up high so he could still see them in the midst of the storm. I like that. It doesn't say that, but you could, you could imagine that and see that happening. But he's gone off to pray. As you know throughout the gospel, Jesus is always taking time away from the crowd because they you know, drain him, if you will, and he has to spend time with the Father. And if Jesus spends time with the Father, how much more we should. Both Matthew and Mark think that the man that they see walking on the water is a ghost. John doesn't say that. doesn't say anything about a ghost. He does say they're scared. He says they're terrified. They're afraid. Both of those, and somehow my cropping must have not got on there, is both of them say, it is I. Jesus' response, it is I, or the I am statement. All three, well, all three say it is I. All three say, don't be afraid, or something to that effect. The interesting one in Matthew, most of you know, that's the one that Peter gets out of the boat. You know, if it's really you, Lord, <laughs> you know, if it's you, tell me to get out of the boat. And he does, and he gets out, and he walks a little bit, and then what happens? Starts to sink, and Jesus grabs him and pulls him up. And I know I've heard tons of sermons. I've probably preached them. He took his eyes off Jesus, and that's why he started sinking. And I guarantee you, if you take your eyes off Jesus, you too will start sinking. Um, Mark says he did this because their hearts were hardened. They had not even understood that when he fed the people with these, this little boy's sack lunch, these two sardines and, and five poor people loaves, we talked about barley loaves being the poorest of poor bread, he took these like five, my wife likes sweet thins. I don't like wheat thins. They are nasty. <laughs> I'd rather have a Ritz or a saltine any day. You know, them kind of them like eating cardboard. He took these two little sardines. Most of us don't like sardines. They make it worse. He took two anchovies, a lot of salt there, and two bad piece, or five bad pieces of bread, if you will, poor people bread, and he feeds over 5,000 to 10,000 people. So in this, all week long, I kept asking myself, and anybody would come in my office or anybody I had lunch with or anybody spending time with me, because I usually get one burning question that bothers me all week and may not be the greatest question in the text. It's just the first one that really comes to my shallow mind. And I think, why did Jesus walk on the water? Because he could. Good answer. He could have flown there miraculously as well. He could have surfboard there. He could have basically said, I'm here, and then I'm there. We see that in the gospel when after the resurrection, he appears miraculously to the disciples. He could have done a number of things. He could have parted the sea like Moses did. He could have dried the sea up and walked across on dry land. But as many commentators will say, well, you know, Moses parted the sea, but God, through his son Jesus, is showing his dominance over all things, and he walked on the sea. Okay, maybe, maybe. But I still think there's even more to it, and hopefully by the end of the sermon we'll come to what that really is, and I won't be just rambling about why did he walk on the water. Uh, and it's time to pause for a second. I've referenced uh, William Barclay before. Barclay bases some of his commentary off of John Bernard, another British uh, theologian, who say that the Greek word epi, like my old next-door neighbor, epi should be translated uh, beside the water. And they completely dismiss the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. But in my baby Greek class, I took one, two, three, four, five semesters of Greek. I cannot speak it. I can't really read it, but I do remember some of it. And I had to remember, memorize all the pronouns in Greek. And Epi was my next door neighbor. Mom, look at my mom and sister, the old man that lived across the street. I started to find a picture of him, tried to, because he's a fun guy. He was a, had a barber shop. He sewed boats, and he worked on chainsaws, all in the barbershop. And he had to be 100 years old when he was cutting my hair because the hands were going like this, and you never knew what you were going to get out of it. And he hired, I remember a young guy, I remember a guy named Mike, Mike that came, and he, everybody went to him. This is like post-Vietnam, but everybody went to Mike because Mike had learned how to cut hair in the military, and he could cut better than Epi. But Epi is a wonderful guy, usually with the... Uh, I don't know if they were camels or palm oils. I mean, the no filters, you know, dangling. I think that was dangling as he was, that's probably why he was shaking. He couldn't see through the smoke. But enough about epi. I remember epi because I memorized that, that preposition epi to be upon. Jesus walked upon the water. Why? Because he could, for sure. But to also show his disciples that not only can I feed your stomachs physically, I can save you physically and spiritually. 
So today, as we look at this dominion he has over all things, Jesus walks on rough seas to rescue those he had told to go into the midst of trouble. And that's our first point for today, obedience in the storm. Let me tell you, as a preacher, as a minister of the gospel, it would be much easier to be an um, evangelist, if you will, to say that once you accept Christ as your Savior, if I could tell my little granddaughter, Bria, wherever she went, she's got to have wet hair somewhere. Did she leave? Oh, went to children's church. Oh, well, right. Well, how many adults went with her too? Yeah. Um, if she was in here, I would love to say to her, honey, you will never have a problem in your life. You'll never have a relationship issue. You'll have all the money you want. You'll never get sick. You'll always drive the newest of cars. I mean, if your parents don't buy it for you, Grandpa won't. But somebody will take care of you your entire life. And the only thing I can say is true in that statement. God will take care of you all of your life. But you will face troubles even if you are a believer in Christ Jesus. The question is, as I told, I think, uh, someone earlier this morning, do you want to enter the storm and go through it with Jesus, or do you want to go through the storm without Jesus? Yeah, with him, absolutely. You know, it's like uh, those Navy folks that are out there, fair winds and following seas. It is not that way in the Christian life, always. Yes, there are some fair winds and, and following seas, but more than times, it's like shooting the rapids of life. Have you ever seen ki kayakers going down or, you know, boats? I, I went on one... You know, I know the kids just, you guys just did one. I went one in uh, New Mexico, and the very first big rapid, it threw everybody out of the boat. And that's the way it is sometimes in our lives. The very first big trouble with the new Christian is, do I get out of the boat and stay out of the boat? Because it's, all of a sudden, I thought I was in the right place, and now I'm having problems. Well, you are in the right place if you're with Jesus. Whether the problems are there or not, you're in the right place when he's with you. Sometimes it's like selling in a sailboat, in the midst of a hurricane or a typhoon. You think, I, I, I'm like in the toilet stool of life. I'm circling around. I'm going to be sucked under. Where is my Savior now? Or like you're riding on the Titanic thinking you're in the luxury of life and all of a sudden the icebergs appear. The disciples' obedience to Jesus ran them directly into a storm. Hear that again. Obedience to Jesus ran them directly into into a storm. If you are obedient to Jesus, sometimes you will go into a storm that he has even sent you toward. They discovered, as many of us have discovered, that you can be both in the center of God's will and still in the storm. Following Jesus doesn't offer immunity, a get out of jail free card, or immunity to troubles. You will get sick. You will suffer pain. You will have relationships that fail. Your kids will not always be saints, even though grandparents think they will be. Your job may let you go. Your finances may fail. Your car may break down. But the storm gives you an opportunity to experience the Savior. He will help you in the midst of your trouble. Life comes with troubles regardless of whether you follow Jesus or not. If you choose to go with him in the midst of troubles, you will have that strength, that assurance that I will come through this. Tony Evans writes, and that's a prominent pastor in Dallas, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, we've showed some of his videos uh, here at the church. He writes, what I want you to know when you think about facing life storms is that Jesus is with you if you're a Christian. You're not alone. And rather than focus on the problems, he says focus on the promises. I think that's pretty sweet stuff. Rather than focus on the pro problem, focus on the promise. Fix your eyes on Jesus, on his word. What does his word say? And lo, I will be with you always. He will bring peace and calm to the struggles that you're facing. I guarantee it. In fact, I even think God has a purpose at times in our lives for pain. Not that he is some kind of sadist and inflicting it, but he, he wants to be able to reveal himself to us. He wants us to want him. 
And sometimes we do walk into these troubled times, these difficult times of our life, as these men did, and discovered that he will be there. Sometimes you may not know that answer of why you face that pain until glory, until you're in heaven. But he has promised that if we love him, he will use the good, the bad, and the bitter winds of life for our good and for his glory. When you feel like giving up, look up and fix your eyes on him. The Sea of Galilee was known for its uh, quick storms. Uh, Galilean storms were often fierce and incredibly chaotic. Once again, I, I uh, aspire to a trip uh, to the Holy Land, but that sea is uh, 6,000 feet below sea level, I understand, somewhere in that nature. I don't know. I probably misquoted that. 6,000 feet below the mountains around it. Nonetheless, it has mountains that cause the winds to do really weird things and whip through there. Um, New Testament theologian uh, N.T. Wright notes that except for fishermen, Jews did not like the water. They were not known to be sailors. I thought that was interesting because they're such a nomadic people. Why wouldn't they be sailors? But only fishermen, Jewish fishermen, liked the water, supposedly. Because he writes that most Jews associated the sea with chaos, with darkness. It was a dark night we see in this text. And even in Daniel, I believe it is, that they talk about a monster in the sea. So no, re no, no wonder they're not afraid. It's, the wind is troubling. Uh, as the other writers say, it's a ghost. But they see someone, and maybe in their back of their minds, they think that it's a monster of some sort, and they are about to scream out in fear for their lives. And Jesus is there. Funny, uh, there were some fishermen in that boat so I'm guessing this is Perry, uh, you know, <laughs> eisegesis. They had to have been able to look at the clouds. I mean, Jesus talks about that, that the, you know, sailors can see the, the clouds and have a prediction of what the weather's going to be like. So as they were getting ready to pull away as it's getting dark, I'm sure, you know, James and John and, and Peter might have said something like, hey, guys, you know, this could be a rough night, but not, not any rougher than we've been on as they headed out. And you have that thought going that there are at least some who know of water and you have this thought that I've just told you that some Jews were culturally didn't like the water. Who does Jesus call us to be? Fishers of men. He tells us basically to get in the midst of trouble with people and bring to them the redemptive story of the good news of Jesus Christ. I have a young man that uh, pinned on the rank of Eagle Scout. Where did his parents go? Are they here? Here they are. Is he over there too? Or is he out sleeping in? He's probably sleeping in. I think you'll see a picture. I won't see a lot of his glory right now. But um, we talked earlier about life-saving merit badge. And then I think there was a Boy Scout life-saving patch that I got. And then I was a city lifeguard for a while and a lake lifeguard. Doesn't mean I can swim. It just means I'm consistent, you know. Really slow paddle wheeler. I mean, I have a lot of water displacement when I swim. Uh, not one of those, uh, you know, sharp boats going through. But the thing I learned over and over in scouts and as a lifeguard, getting in the water was the last thing you do. We would shout out, <laughs> throw, row, as it, throw, no, mm -mm. reach. That's the first one. It shows you how slow I am. Reach. If you can reach them from the side of the pool or the side of the water to pull them out, you reach for them. If you can't do that, you throw some kind of buoyancy device. If that didn't work, you get into a rowboat. So it was reach, throw, row, and then finally go. And Jesus tells us to go first. Go. Go and reach these who are lost for my sake. And what does Jesus do himself? He goes into the water for his disciples. Reach, throw, row, and go. When the disciples see him, they are terrified. And perhaps you've seen similar videos, but I want to show you this one because it's kind of fun. And uh, I never saw this in, in my trip of whale watching, but here's somebody who was doing some whale watching last year. A couple was on a whale watching expedition off the tip of Antarctica, checking out these killer whales. When they noticed one little penguin who was in quite the rush. I have felt like that penguin. I'm sure you have too. He's running from the killer whales. He doesn't want to end up as lunch. That did not sound well. Oh, the penguin's still. Go, 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 penguin. 
That's when Jimmy makes a jump for it. He's trying to get in the boat. It almost did. I think I got it. Oh, it's still going. Let's try that again. Not quite. One Ouch. more time. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. He's in. Keep swimming, little buddy. The penguin is in the boat. He's in the boat. He's in the boat. He's in the boat. with him? Well, I don't know. Save him. This penguin said, not today, orcas. Yay. Thank you. Uh, so that brings me to my final point. Uh, the boat didn't save it. Well, I guess it did save him. Uh, the boat didn't save the disciples. Jesus saved the disciples. Boats are optional in his case. As he steps into the boat, the other thing, I, you know, takeaways I've read all week, you know, what, what is he meaning? What's it saying? He gets into the boat, and immediately they are at their destination. That ought to say something to us. If we take Jesus with us, do we get there quicker? Ah, those long drives maybe go a little better when he's with you in the, in the car or on the journey. But it's interesting that he says when he gets in the boat, they immediately are to their destination. And remember, I, in that parallel I did, Mark says he was about to walk by them. There's a sermon right there. Don't let Jesus pass you by. But he wasn't about to walk on by without helping his disciples, nor will he let us go without helping us. Mark says they had their hard hearts. They had yet to grasp the feeding of the uh, 5,000 event. And in the reading we'll have next week, he will talk to them about who he really is. Jesus saves not only the physical, but the spiritual. Now, I have owned two boats in my life. Uh, neither one of them uh, were very good boats. Um, I think on the first one, I didn't even have the bare minimum that the Coast Guard requires. How many of you own a boat? I know some of you. I'm looking at one. Don't you still have a boat? What do you have to have on that boat by Coast Guard regulations, you know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Suntan lotion? Yeah. Anybody? You gotta have a, you're supposed to have a life preserver for each occupant. That, that's like a bare minimum. I don't, that is typically required, but as I, as I tried to peruse it this week, I, I knew that, in fact, I thought you had to have, and it depends on the size of the boat. Depends on the size of the boat and where the boat is going. Uh, the one boat I owned was uh, <laughs> like a wooden John boat <laughs> that had been fiberglass on the bottom that made it so heavy that it barely had any momentum <laughs> once we got the engine to work. A college buddy and I bought it together, and I think we truly only had it in the water like three times. Because we bought a boat and didn't even have a truck or trailer to pull it with. I mean, <laughs> so we had to rely on other friends to get us to the lake. But, uh, yeah, crazy. And then I, I bought one uh, when I was stationed in uh, Mississippi to live on. And I hired a, a captain to help me get it from uh, Pascagoula, I think it was, where we went. And we took it down, you know, the coastline and brought it into the harbor there at uh, Biloxi. Um, but you ha oh, we had to have on it... Uh, a, a life jacket for each one of us, a throwable flotation device. They wanted to have some sort of audible horn, also some sort of flag in case, in case you know, something to wave at people. And then I think you also had to have a fire extinguisher. We had, that, that boat had two engines on it, and I thought, <laughs> what's the worst thing you'd do? Burn up while you're drowning. But, and, and that boat would have burned up if it had an opportunity. But uh, how foolish we are to say, that, well, if I ever got on a boat, uh, you, oh, I'd make sure everybody had a, a life preserver. Yeah, don't be that arrogant because there are a lot of us that got on boats and never strapped on the life preserver. And then the thing flips, hits you in the head, and you don't swim at all when you're knocked out. Yeah. Um, so it's the same sort of spiritual arrogance or uh, superiority, some of us think, that I would always be able to signal and, and see that the Savior is coming. This is the fifth of seven signs that the Gospel of John has for us thus far. And I haven't been labeling for them for you, but that first one was turning water into wine. The second one was, yeah, the second one, the second one was healing the royal man's son. Uh, I called him Basil. 
because his name, the basilica is the word we get for a royal area, and that's how they referred to him. The third one was the paralytic, the man who was to be carried into the, the sea there, or the water there at Bethesda. And then the fourth one was the feeding of the 5,000. So now we have the fifth sign. And I wonder how many signs it takes each of you to grab a life jacket, to recognize the sound of the horn, to see the flag waving, to get the fire extinguisher to put out the flames of pain in your heart, to truly say, I'll grab whatever I have to float with the Savior because Jesus saves. Christ offers salvation to all those who will believe in him and he will bring comfort in the storms of our life. A perfect storm is a storm that in the midst of our troubling times, we obediently follow him and trust in him. That's a perfect storm. Trusting in him in the midst of our troubles perfectly because he will save. Jesus saves. Stand with me, please. We pray. Father, as we come now to a time of invitation in this service, if there's someone here who has never put their faith in Jesus to say, I, I, I want to be redeemed, I want to be saved because of the work of the Savior, Jesus. Let him step into the boat of my life. Let me make room in the boat of my life. Let me cast it all aside and make room for Jesus in my heart. And then when I face these storms of life, he will bring me comfort, he will give me strength. I will trust in him for he says, do not be afraid, I am with you. Father, let your Holy Spirit move in our congregation today. If there's someone who just wants to come to these steps and kneel and pray and leave the burdens of this life here at the altar, your Son is faithful to lighten our load. Help us, we pray, in this hour, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.